Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending where you are. I'm Arthur Appleton. I'm based in Geneva, and I teach international trade law in uh, Bologna, SAIS Europe. I have a very much a vested interest in this election because although I'm Swiss, I'm also American, so I'm very interested in the session that wants to follow, uh, that's going to follow. But before we start, let me begin by saying thank you to the International Law Society and Akansha for organizing this, and for Jessica and Pedro behind the scenes who have made this all very possible. Your work uh, for this event is very much appreciated. Let me also apologize for the confusion on time. We changed clocks one uh, a couple weeks earlier than in the States. We do a lot of things faster here, but um, this time it, it caused an inconvenience in the scheduling. Now, I have the pleasure today to introduce Professor Schneebaum, Stephen Schneebaum, who's going to speak about uh, how we watch election results in the United States. I can think of no better person to undertake this responsibility because uh, Stephen teaches constitutional law at Johns Hopkins in Washington. And of course, this is going to, or may involve some very important constitutional questions, not just in the presentation, but what may happen after uh, the election as well. So to introduce Professor Schneebaum. Professor Schneebaum is very importantly the interim director of the International Law and Organization Program uh, in 2019 and 2020. He's been a lawyer in private practice uh, for four decades. He is very much involved in international human rights. He has his own law firm now in Washington, but before that spent years as a partner in some of the bigger DC firms. He currently serves on the board of directors of the American branch of the International Law Association. And for those of you international lawyers, the ILA is extremely important. And he's also involved with the International Law Students Association. He's educated at Yale, a small place competing with Harvard up in New England somewhere, received his Bachelor of Arts degree, magna cum laude at Oberlin College, um, and also uh, studied, of course, at Oxford, another small, small little place. So he has a very illustrious background, uh, first class honors in his degrees, uh, law degree, also uh, master's in comparative law for GW. Now, what are we going to do today? We have a lot on the agenda. We're going to look, first of all, in terms of what to expect on November 3rd. We'll talk about the Electoral College. We'll talk about House and Senate seats. We'll talk about what can go wrong. And a lot can go wrong, judging by the actions of the Supreme Court in the last couple of days. We'll talk about paper ballots. We'll talk about advanced voting. We'll talk about hacks to voting machines. And we'll talk about the real nitty gritty of the politics. We'll talk about the states where it may be too close to call the election. And we'll talk about what might happen in the very remote chance that there are ties. Lastly, we'll finish with political predictions, prognostication about uh, who may win this election and about which House and Senate seats may flip. With that introduction, Akansha, I turned it over to you and I'm looking forward to a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, now, before I invite Professor Schneebaum, I just have one quick uh, note. We don't have the chat function on this event, but please do put your questions all in the Q&A box. Um, we are, I'm hoping for a very interesting event. And I, I know I personally have a lot of questions I've already picked Professor Schneebaum's brain about, but after this, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be coming up with a lot more questions. So Professor Schneebaum, you can now start. Well, thank you very much, Akanksha, and, and thank you, Professor Appleton, for the kind introduction. Uh, this event was motivated by uh, a desire to accommodate uh, one of SAIS's strengths. We are a school of advanced international studies, but more importantly than that, we're a student, we are a school of international students. And those students, many of them, uh, have never witnessed what we are about to see on Tuesday. They've never witnessed what we have already seen during this very dramatic uh, presidential campaign. So the, the motivation here is to explain first, as Professor Appleton said, the basics. How does this election work? What is really going on as Americans cast their votes? Second, we'll talk about what might go wrong. And third, finally, We'll conclude with a session, a little discussion of what to look for on election night. As we are all glued to our television sets, how do we interpret the results that we are getting from, from CNN or from Fox or from PBS or whatever we happen to be watching on Tuesday night? 
So that's, that's what I hope to accomplish today. And uh, we have to start, of course, with basics. Why do, the, why do Americans elect their president in this indirect way? What is the point? What is the goal? And where does it come from? How, do we, how did it come about that Americans do not elect their president by popular vote, but rather through this construct called the Electoral College? So we'll start with that. The Electoral College comprises individuals who are selected by the respective political parties in each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia. Those people's names do not appear on the ballot. When we cast our votes for Donald Trump or for Joe Biden, we are not actually voting for them. We are voting for a group of anonymous individuals, the number varies by state, I'll go through that in a moment, um, who have pledged to cast their votes in the Electoral College when it meets on December 14th uh, for the candidates that we have favored. Why does this, what does this mean in, in practice? What it means is that the Electoral College vote is what is ultimately to determine who will be the next president of the United States. There have been five occasions in American history in which a president was elected without winning the popular vote, but merely on the basis of an Electoral College majority. Those five, just for historians among you or, or trivia buffs among you, uh, were first in 1824 when John Quincy Adams was elected, uh, next in 1876 in a very tightly contested Electoral College vote, Rutherford Hayes was selected by the electors, although Samuel Tilden won the popular vote. Just a few years later, in 1888, uh, Benjamin Harrison was elected president uh, in, a, in a, a contest against the then incumbent Grover Cleveland. Harrison lost the popular vote, but won in the Electoral College. And the last two times that the popular vote did not determine the outcome were times in our, in our lifetimes. In 2000, George W. Bush lost the popular vote and nevertheless was elected, uh, selected by the Electoral College. Um, some would say he was selected by the Supreme Court. We'll come back to that topic later. Uh, and then of course, in 2016, uh, Donald Trump lost the popular vote by about 3 million votes and yet nevertheless uh, prevailed in the Electoral College. In each state, with two exceptions, the winner of the state's popular vote controls or, or determines all of the state's electors. So if, as happened in 2000, George W. Bush wins the popular vote in Florida by a hair, by 500 and some odd votes, he receives all of the electors uh, in the state of Florida. And so, and, and that's why there can be these anomalies of uh, someone losing the popular vote, but winning in the electoral college. The two exceptions are Maine and Nebraska. In both of those states, um, two electoral votes are determined by the state's popular winner and the remainder of the electoral votes are determined on the basis of congressional districts. Um, otherwise, it's winner take all. Electoral votes are assigned to the states uh, under the Constitution uh, as the number of representatives that each state has in Congress. Every state has two senators, so therefore every state has at least those two electoral votes. And then every state has at least one member of the House of Representatives. Therefore, the minimum number of electoral votes that any state can have is three. And from then on, the uh, population of the states determines the number of electoral votes that they will have because the more the population, the more members of the House of Representatives the state has, and therefore adding the two senators to the whatever the number is of members of the House gives you the total number of electors that each state has. In addition, incidentally, the District of Columbia under the 23rd Amendment uh, adopted in 1961 is entitled to three electoral votes, even though 
the district, uh, and I speak as a resident of the district, uh, has no representatives uh, in either the House of Representatives uh, or the Senate, at least no voting representatives. So given that there are 435 seats in the House, 100 seats in the Senate, and three votes assigned to the District of Columbia, the total number of electors is 538, and therefore the majority required to win the election is 270. Those 270 electoral votes could come from any number of states, again, depending upon uh, the electoral votes assigned to each of the states. The electors, as I said, are pledged to vote for the candidate uh, whose party they uh, nominated them to become electors. Um, and just this past term, the Supreme Court uh, had to decide the question whether uh, electors are free to uh, deviate from their pledge, that is, to cast their electoral votes for someone other than the candidate uh, on whose behalf they ran. And the Supreme Court said that states may penalize electors for doing that, but nevertheless, electors are free to do so if they are willing to uh, undergo whatever penalty, uh, fine, for example, uh, that the states may impose on them. Now, this system um, is, since it is not reflective of the popular vote, uh, raises questions about whether it is properly grounded in democratic principles. And I will argue that it is manifestly not. Indeed, the electoral college system has two major flaws. One is that it simply skews the way in which presidential campaigns are conducted, and the other is that it does not give appropriate weight to the principle of one person, one vote. Let me explain what I mean by that. First, in terms of skewing the way campaigns are conducted, certain states are predictably either Democratic states or Republican states. And incidentally, I'm going to use the shorthand terminology that Americans are used to. Uh, Democratic states we generally refer to as blue, and Republican states are generally referred to as red. So I'll be talking about blue and red states. Of the largest states in the, in the country, three of them, California, New York, and Illinois, are deeply blue. And therefore, neither candidate for the presidency this year or in most years needed to campaign in those states at all. Neither candidate needed to waste time or resources on attempting to persuade voters in those three states um, uh, to vote for their candidates. But those three states, which are ignored in the presidential campaign, comprise 20% of the American population. And those three states also contain three of the five largest cities in the United States, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. So there's something essentially undemocratic about the notion that uh, the voters in those three large cities, in those three large states, uh, are simply not factors in the selection of the president. We know what they're going to do, their votes are taken for granted, and they can be safely ignored. In most years, that would also have been true for a fourth state, uh, and maybe even for a fifth. Texas and Florida would generally have been thought of as red states, Republican states, and yet in this electoral contest, both of them are very much in play. Uh, and they constitute another 12% of the American population. So again, the idea that the focal point of uh, electoral efforts during the campaign are the so-called swing states, that is the states that might be red or might be blue and it's close, those are the states that get all of the attention, those are the voters that both candidates are competing to attract, and everyone else simply is overlooked. Now that is, that is an oddity, and presumably that is also something of profoundly undemocratic significance. But even worse than that is the fact that the Electoral College allocations do not reflect the reality of the American population. 
So to explain what I mean by that, it's necessary to do a little history. And so I propose to spend a couple of minutes explaining how the Electoral College came about. Uh, when the founders created the Constitution of the United States in the 1780s, one of the principles they had in mind was that while there would be democratic elections for local representatives, for members of the House of Representatives, or for state officials, governors, state legislators, uh, the presidency would be something different. The president was to be a, a, a statesman of such uh, elevated stature that it would be inappropriate simply to allow the people to choose between two candidates or from a list of candidates. Rather, they would select someone who some wise men, and of course in those days there were always men, wise men who would convene in the electoral college to decide who should be the leader of the country. But to do that, they needed to come up with a system for deciding who would elect these electors, these people who would ultimately control the outcome of the election. There were, at the time of the American Revolution and the beginnings of this country, um, there were tensions between the states which needed to be ironed out in order to forge the various agreements that underlay the Constitution that was adopted in 1787. There were, comp there were conflicts, there were disagreements between states that had more agricultural focus and states that did not, between states that depended on coastal on their coastal situation and states that were more inland. But most importantly of all, there were severe uh, disagreements between those states in which the institution of slavery was practiced and those in which it was not. And so to determine how the various states would be represented in the electoral college, two compromises needed to be reached. First, a compromise between the more populous states and the smaller ones, and second, a compromise between the states that maintained or permitted slavery and those that did not. The first of those is the so-called Connecticut Compromise, and that compromise led to the structure of our bicameral legislature. That is the idea that all states have two representatives in the United States Senate, regardless of their population, and that the uh, membership of the House of Representatives is determined on the basis of the number of people in each state. The big states in, 17, in the 1780s were Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. Among those four, uh, each of them comprised over 10% of the total population of the United States, four of the 13, soon to be 14 states that made up the country. The small states were Delaware, Rhode Island, Georgia, and, North, and New Hampshire. None of those had more than three and a half percent of the total population of the country. So the ratio of the smallest state, Delaware, to the biggest state, Virginia, was about one to 12. So it was a 12 to one disparity in their populations. And so therefore it was understood and it was accepted that Delaware with one twelfth of the population of Virginia would have the same number of US senators, although obviously a smaller number of representatives in the house. That one to 12 ratio was not considered by the founders to be distortive of democracy. But there was another problem. The other problem had to do with what, how to reckon into the counting of population people who were enslaved. Now on the one hand, the uh, southern states, the slave states, argued that all of the people in slavery should be counted. They should be counted because uh, that would beef up that would augment the number of seats in the House that these states were entitled to have. The northern states, the free states, the states without slavery, said, look, it may well be, and in fact, we insist 
that enslaved people are human beings like everyone else, but you don't treat them that way. You treat them as if they were farm animals. You treat them as if they were objects. And so therefore they shouldn't be counted at all. And if they are not to be counted at all, then suddenly the population of Virginia, the population of North Carolina declines significantly and the entitlement to seats in the House of Representatives declines significantly as well. Well, the compromise that was reached, and this is certainly not a matter of, of, of pride in American history, the compromise that was reached was that enslaved individuals would be counted as three-fifths of a person. That three-fifths compromise reflected, again, not, not what you would expect and not what is popularly understood. It was the slave states that insisted that enslaved people be counted fully, while it was the free states that insisted that they shouldn't be counted at all. And the compromise again was this three-fifths allocation. So considering any human being to be three-fifths of another human being is obviously offensive. But again, the motivation was not uh, driven by a, uh, a, a lower view of enslaved people by uh, the slave masters in the South. Quite the opposite was true. And that three-fifths compromise allowed Virginia and North Carolina in particular, Georgia, South Carolina to a lesser extent, to increase their representations in the House of Representatives beyond what would have been correct, what would have been reasonable, what would have been reflective of actual numbers had enslaved individuals not been counted. So the system of the Electoral College actually fostered and underscored and promoted the institution of slavery. That was the original concept. And some would even argue that it was driven by concerns of the slave states to maintain their power. And indeed history supports that view to some degree because of the first seven presidents uh, elected by the Electoral College, five, all of them except John Adams and John Quincy Adams were not only representatives of slave states, but they were themselves slave owners. And that's not an accident. That reflects the increased role, the increased power uh, of the states that permitted and maintained the institution of slavery. So in the first Congress, or I'm sorry, in, yes, in the first Congress, um, Virginia had 10 seats, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania had eight each. Virginia was a slave state, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania were not, and their free populations were almost the same, yet Virginia was overrepresented. Um, Georgia and New Hampshire um, both had three seats in the House, but excluding enslaved people, the population of New Hampshire was much larger than that of Georgia. So um, in 1792, uh, the first uh, presidential election in which uh, there had been a, a, a census uh, on the basis of which seats were, were allocated. Um, Virginia had 12 votes, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania had 10. And um, again, that skewed the outcome in favor of the Southern states. Now, as I said, at the beginning, the ratio of the smallest state to the biggest, both with equal representation in the Senate, and therefore both with skewed representations in the Electoral College, the ratio was one to 12. That was pretty bad. But today, the ratio between the smallest state in the country, Wyoming, and the largest state in the country, California, is no longer one to 12. It's one to 68. And that means that a, the two senators from Wyoming and the two senators from California who have the same power in the United States Senate. The two senators from California represent 68 times as many Americans as the two senators from Wyoming. So the skewing of the outcome is no longer in favor of slave states. Obviously, slavery was abolished after the Civil War, 
but it is now a skewing in favor of smaller and more rural states. And it's a problem that goes way beyond the Electoral College. The Senate itself is now inherently undemocratic because of the overrepresentation of rural small population states. Today, the uh, state of California has 55 electoral votes and Wyoming has three, which means that the ratio between their electoral college representations is 18.3 to one. And that means that uh, Wyoming and other smaller states are overrepresented in the electoral college. And indeed, if you do the arithmetic, um, each California elector represents about 718,000 people. So by that, taking that as a benchmark, to have three electoral votes, a state should have about 2.1, 2.2 million residents. But there are 15 states in the country, plus the District of Columbia, whose population is smaller than that. And each of them have three electoral votes. In fact, some of them even have four, um, and all of them are therefore overrepresented. And of the 16 states that are overrepresented, or 16 jurisdictions, eight of them are reliably red, five of them are reliably blue. So you can see again that the deck is somewhat stacked in the Electoral College in favor of rural states, smaller states, and therefore red states. Now, that um, that bias is very clear when you think that 80% of the American population today live either in or near large cities. And yet there are 28 states in the country, including those overrepresented states that have no city of over a half a million people. So again, if we are going ever to achieve some sort of um, accurate reflection of democratic outcomes, something's gonna be done about that. And there are various proposals to do that. Obviously the constitution could be amended, but that is a very difficult, complicated and tedious process. And it is very unlikely, I think, that given the, um, the sort of embedded overrepresentation of rural states and the power of the United States Senate, it's very unlikely such a thing could happen. There are other proposals that have been floated. One of them is the so-called interstate compact um, in which uh, some states have agreed already that uh, they would be willing to change the system so that their electors would be pledged not to the person who wins the popular vote in that state, but the person who wins the popular vote nationally. And given that the constitution allows each state to make its own electoral rules, that would not require a constitutional amendment. That would require simply an agreement between states. Now the interstate compact has been approved by a number of states already, but in each case, its effectiveness depends upon its being endorsed by enough states to create an electoral college majority. And that has not happened yet. It could happen. And if it did, it would substantially change the way in which American presidential campaigns are conducted because suddenly Los Angeles and New York City would become important when now they're not, but it would also change the way in which the outcome is determined. Again, the important thing to realize here and underlying this interstate compact idea, and underlying everything I'm going to say from now on, is that the Constitution allows the states to make their own rules for the selection of electors, for the allocation of the electoral votes, and ultimately for the conduct of presidential elections. The states are entitled to do that. And indeed, the Constitution says, and we'll come back to this point because it has recently become very important, not only the states have their own, uh, have the authority to do this, but state legislatures have the authority to make the rules for each of the 50 states uh, and, uh, and the District of Columbia, which is kind of in a, in a separate category. So how are these rules set? 
you know, the, um, uh, I, I, there's a famous quote that is attributed to, to Vladimir Lenin, although there's really no historical evidence that he ever said this or ever thought it. But the quote that is somehow always attributed to him is, he who votes has no power. He who counts the votes has power. Now, whether Lenin said it or not, uh, there's some truth to that, obviously, because the counting of the votes is obviously vital in determining electoral outcomes. Um, the states at the moment get to control counting, and more than that, they get to control the electoral procedure. They get to set the hours of voting on election day, the first Tuesday following the first Monday in November. This year, as you all know, November 3rd, next Tuesday. They get to decide at what hours the polls will be open. They get to decide where the polls will be located. They get to decide the rules for absentee voting and for advance voting and for all of the procedures for actually casting votes. Will it be electronic? Will it be on paper? Will it be some hybrid between the two? All of that is up to the individual states to regulate. And they have done so with enormous variations amongst themselves, as, as we have, have all been uh, observing from the recent uh, coverage in the media. All of those things uh, are, are different as between states, and that makes it very difficult to suggest any kind of generalization about how voting will be conducted on Tuesday or how counting will be conducted following next Tuesday. This year, because of the pandemic, there has been a, a greater focus than ever on uh, voting other than voting in person. You know, we've always had, in most of the states at least, uh, some ability to cast votes if you are unable to be present on election day. You're traveling, you're ill, you're disabled, something of that nature. You have always been able to obtain in virtually all of the states an absentee ballot, and you would have to fill it out on paper. Sometimes you'd have to sign it. Sometimes you'd have to have it notarized. Sometimes you'd have to mail it in, in time to reach the electoral headquarters by election day. In other states, it simply needs to be postmarked by election day to be counted. There's always been that process available to Americans. In many states, uh, early voting has been possible. Here in the District of Columbia, for example, um, it's been the case for years that you could go to a polling center in advance of election day and cast your vote uh, and that vote would count, that vote would be submitted, um, even though you did not cast it on the day. And there were, again, lots of reasons people would do that. They might be unavailable, they might be unable or unwilling to stand in line for the hours that it sometimes takes to get access to a voting machine uh, in, say, the District of Columbia. But this year, there's a special focus on that. This morning's newspaper reports that in the state of Texas, more people have cast their ballots as of this morning than cast their ballots in the presidential election of 2016. And we're still four or five days before election day. People in Texas will still have the right, should they choose to exercise it, to go to the polls on Tuesday and cast their votes themselves or to mail in their absentee ballots or their advance ballots uh, in, in, before uh, election day. Uh, now, that, of course, that, that huge increase in uh, paper voting, paper ballot voting um, by mail-in or by drop-off or the various systems that states have adopted uh, will cause all sorts of difficulties that electoral commissions in the states have never had to face before. In the past, the number of votes were cast that way was relatively small. Military members often voted, in fact, usually voted by some form of absentee ballot. People who were traveling, again, people who were disabled, but it was a relatively small number. Now we have an enormous number of votes. And so all of a sudden, it becomes very important to focus on when and how those votes will be counted. There are um, a number of states, 14 to be precise, 
that do not allow the counting of absentee or other paper ballots to begin until the polls have closed. Other states have allowed the counting to begin as the votes are received. Some of them allow the counting to begin on the morning of election day, so that presumably the count can be, if not concluded, at least well along the way by the end of the day. But 14 states um, do not allow the counting to start until the polls physically close on Tuesday evening. And of those 14 states, three this year are potential swing states, that is states that may go either way uh, in their selection of their electors. Those are Maine, Minnesota, and New Hampshire. Um, and so because there are 14 states whose count may be delayed, in fact, may be substantially delayed, because in other states, including, for example, Pennsylvania and North Carolina, voters may cast their ballots as long and, and have them counted as long as they are postmarked by election day, and therefore they may not arrive for three, four days after that. Those votes will obviously be delayed in, in, in the tally. Uh, we may or we may not witness a substantial delay in uh, determining outcomes on Tuesday evening. And that is inevitable. It's a result of the pandemic. It's a result of the insistence of many voters that it is simply not safe to go to a polling place and to stand in line with other people, perhaps for hours. Um, and uh, therefore, the old system of counting votes is simply going to have to accommodate to this emergency. Some states will rise to the occasion. Uh, interestingly, the state of Florida, which was, of course, the ultimate swing state back in 2000, um, has made enormous advances in the way that it counts paper ballots. And Florida may actually be a state that, despite the massive number of paper votes they have to count, they may actually be prepared to announce results on Tuesday evening. But other states are not going to have that advantage. Now, is that is that a problem? Well, later I'll talk about what might go wrong, uh, but it does pose some challenges, uh, not only to the, the accuracy, the fairness of the election itself, but of the reliability of what we are hearing on Tuesday. So um, when we watch results on Tuesday evening, we will see, this is typical, traditional, uh, the networks, the television networks, will be calling the states. They will be declaring that candidate X has won state Y, and it's clear from the immediate count. There will be states that are declared for a candidate within seconds of the time that the polls close. How can that possibly be? Well, the, the networks and the algorithms that they employ, employ to determine results are fairly sophisticated. And they know that um, if they count even sample districts, sample voting locations, and they see trends there, they know that a blue state is going to be blue. There's not going to be a whole lot of wait time before the outcome in Connecticut is decided. Now, as it happens, um, the first states to declare, the first states to close their polls on Tuesday will be Indiana and Kentucky, both of them reliably red states. When we come to the section of the talk on what to watch for an election night, I'll expand on that thought further. Now, let me just cover quickly what happens in the Senate races and the House races. Typically, you know, the Senate is 100 members, 50 times two, so, and they serve six-year terms, and those terms are staggered. So typically, there would be 33 Senate seats up for election. This year, we have not 33, but 35. The reason for that is that in two states, Arizona and Georgia, uh, there are Senate races that have been driven by a vacancy in a Senate seat. In the case of Arizona, caused by the death of Senator John McCain. In the case of Georgia, um, the health-driven uh, resignation of Senator Johnny Isaacson. In both of those states, there will be special elections to fill the remaining portion 
of the six-year terms uh, prematurely terminated by Gen Senator McCain's death and Senator Isaacson's resignation. And now the current alignment of the Senate is 53 Republicans, 47 Democrats. And um, that means that for the Democrats to achieve a majority in the Senate, they are going to have to pick up four seats, a net of four seats, in order to have 51 senators in the Congress that is sworn in in January. It is expected by the Democrats that they will pick up at least three seats in the states of Maine, Colorado, Arizona, and North Carolina. They, Democrats expect to win those four seats. They also expect to lose the incumbent senator's seat in the state of Alabama, where Doug Jones, the Democrat, was elected two years ago, four years, I'm sorry, no, uh, four years ago to fill a vacancy uh, left by uh, Jeff Sessions when he resigned to become attorney general. Um, and um, no, I was right the first time, two years ago, 2018, um, Jones was elected under very unusual circumstances, a Democrat in a deeply red state. It is very likely that he will lose his seat on Tuesday. So Democrats expect to pick up four, they expect to lose one, that's three, net of three, that would produce a 50-50 split in the Senate. If there is a 50 to 50 split in the Senate, not just generally, but on any individual vote, the vice president of the United States performs his, and I can now proudly say, or her role of being president of the Senate and casting a deciding vote. So a 50 to 50 outcome in the Senate, if the Biden-Harris ticket wins, gives the Democrats a majority in the Senate. 50 to 50 split if the Trump-Pence ticket wins, gives the Republicans a majority in the Senate. But there are other Senate seats that are very much in play. There are two seats in the state of Georgia. Both of them are seats that the Democrats think they can win. There is a tightly contested race in the state of South Carolina, where the Democrats think they have a shot at winning. Also in the state of Iowa and in the state of Montana. And if there really is a Democratic wave on Tuesday, which is possible, uh, the Democrats think that they might even have a shot at the Senate seats in such red states as Kentucky and, um, Arkansas and uh, Alaska and even Texas. And even if there's a landslide for Biden, even Mississippi. So the Democrats have a number of ways of achieving a Senate majority. The Republicans, because they're defending a lot more seats this year, they're defending 23 seats, the Democrats are defending only 12. The Republicans have a shorter and, and uh, narrower path, but they do have their eyes uh, on the seat in uh, Michigan, currently held by a Democrat. Uh, there are some suggestions, some of the polls are showing that that race may be extremely tight. And of course, Michigan is one of the states that determined the um, electoral outcome for the presidency last time. The new Senate will take, its, uh, take office on January 3rd, with one exception, the senator elected in uh, Arizona uh, to fill the, the vacancy created by the death of Senator McCain and the temporary appointment of Senator McSally. That senator uh, will be sworn in as soon as the outcome of the election is certified. So we could have a shift in the Senate, a small one, uh, as early as the end of November. The second seat in Georgia is subject to a very peculiar set of state rules. Um, that seat must be won, this is the, the residue of Senator Isaacson's term, this seat must be won by 50% uh, plus one of the voters. If nobody gets a 50% plus one uh, result on election night, then uh, it will go to runoff. Uh, the runoff election will be held in December. And so it may well be that the outcome of the next Senate will not be decided until sometime in December if the Georgia seat ends up being the swing seat as it may well be. In the House of Representatives, because they serve two-year terms, all 435 seats are up this year. 
Uh, the current breakdown in the House is 232 Democrats, 197 Republicans, and six vacancies. The Republicans, therefore, would need a pickup of 31 seats in order to achieve the majority. Most polls are showing that that is far beyond reach and that, if anything, it is likely that the Democratic majority will increase. The question is, by how much? The uh, leader of the House of Representatives, the Speaker, currently Nancy Pelosi of California, uh, is elected by uh, the House itself, by the majority party. Uh, she, he or she is typically the leader of the majority party in the House, as uh, Representative Pelosi is. Um, this becomes important. I mean, Speaker of the House is always important, but particularly important this year, because under the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, the Speaker of the House of Representatives is third in line, next in line after the Vice President to the presidency. And there are scenarios, I'll get to one in a minute, in which that could have some significance on January 20. There's a substantial, um, you know, the polls are showing a substantial momentum, as I said, behind uh, the Democrats. In 2018, Democrats picked up 41 seats. That's a huge number. Nobody's expecting that big a shift uh, this year. Um, and again, the new House will also take office on January 3rd. There are also 11 states that are electing governors this year. Currently, four, four of those seats are Republican. I'm sorry, no, seven of them are Republican. Four are held by Democrats. It's not likely that that will shift much, if at all. Uh, the Democrats hope to defend their four seats um, and to pick up governorships in Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, the Republicans think they have a good shot at the governor's race in Montana, uh, a red state with a blue governor, um, and perhaps in North Carolina uh, as well. The terms of election of the governors are, are totally up to the states, and I won't spend more time on that now. Now, what could go wrong? What could go wrong on Tuesday? Well, <laughs> plenty, plenty, but two categories of things that could go wrong. One has to do with what will happen in terms of the eligibility to vote. Who gets to vote? There have already been reports of uh, voter intimidation. That's a potential problem. There have been reports of states, um, not reports, the provable. There are states that have made it extremely difficult to cast uh, advance votes. States that are requiring, for example, that paper ballots be signed, some of them be signed and notarized or signed and witnessed, all putting uh, burdens on voters, which will be felt especially by minority communities and by elderly people. And so, uh, and states that are making it difficult to drop off votes. For example, the state of Texas, which has decided uh, through its legislature that it would be appropriate to have one drop off place per county. Now, visualize the state of Texas, right? Texas has some huge cities like Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, big cities. In those big cities, there will be one drop off point. And then Texas also has counties that are as big as some New England states. And in those counties, there will be one drop off point. Now, why is that? Well, obviously, some would argue, and I think correctly, but neither here nor there, some would argue this was an open attempt to make it difficult to vote. But whether that was the intent or not, it's obviously the effect it is more difficult to vote under these circumstances. It's more difficult to vote if the process of voting is extremely complicated, if the ballot instructions include a lot of language that is not part of the common vocabulary of Americans. All of those devices can make it difficult to vote and will invariably, inevitably, give rise to litigation over the access to the ballot uh, following Tuesday's election, regardless of the outcome. The other kinds of problems that we, we face, the other kinds of things that go wrong would be, what happens if it's close? What happens if Tuesday night, we have no idea who has been elected president, or for that matter, even who has been elected to the Senate? But that's a problem. We, we have had, in our recent past, one experience with a delayed outcome, obviously that was in 2000, 
Um, and the American people uh, tolerated that in 2000. Um, indeed, tolerated it with remarkable patience. Is that likely to happen again? I don't think so. Not in this polarized political climate. With the President of the United States already saying, we must have a result on Tuesday night. Whoever is ahead on Tuesday night wins. All of those other votes would be discounted. That obviously is nonsense. It's not true. As a matter of fact, it's not legal. But it doesn't matter. There are a lot of people out there in this great land of ours who listen to that and say, right, whoever is ahead on Tuesday night is the winner. And any attempt to change that result is hijacking, is thievery, is fraud. Now, we might all say, come on, give me a break. That's, that's simply wrong. But that, again, doesn't matter. There is an enormous passionate uh, coterie of supporters of that view out there, and again, supported by no less than the President of the United States. Now, um, we will probably not have a definitive outcome on Tuesday night. We may, um, if, I, I'll get to this in a short time, but if, if, uh, if Joe Biden easily wins the state of Florida, I think we can predict with some confidence that he will be elected the next president, but, but that may not happen. It may be close. He may lose. And then what? Um, so um, in the pre-tech age, we were more patient. In an age of social media, in an age of instantaneous electronic gratification, uh, there will be a lot of Americans who go to bed very unhappy on Tuesday night if they do not know who won the election. Now, what happens if it, whether, you know, the counting is over and it's still too close to call? What happens then? Well, the Constitution provides that if the Electoral College is literally tied, or if no one achieves a majority in the Electoral College, then the election goes, the election for the president goes to the House of Representatives, the election of the vice president goes to the Senate. That's happened only once in American history. And let's pray it doesn't happen this time, because talk about undemocratic outcomes. If that were to happen, the House of Representatives would choose the president, but not on the basis of a simple roll call vote. The Constitution provides that if the House needs to choose a winner of a tied electoral college, each state gets one vote. And that means a state whose, uh, the majority of whose members of the House are Democrats get to vote for the Democrat. The states whose majority representation is Republican gets to vote for the Republican. Again, skewing in favor of the rural states, which are more likely deeply red, and skewing against the more populous states. The California will have one vote. It'll go to Joe Biden. Wyoming will have one vote. It will go to Donald Trump. We can predict that to a certainty. The outcome will depend upon the very fine tuning of who has the majority of the House of Representatives seats in the mid-sized states, in Pennsylvania, in Iowa, in Arizona. Um, and that is uh, uncharted territory for the American people. In the Senate, the vice president is elected by one person, one vote, and presumably whichever party wins the Senate will, will control, in the event of a tie vote, will control uh, the selection of the vice president, leading to the possibility, incidentally, that for the first time since the year 1800, it is at least theoretically possible that we could have a president and vice president of different political parties. Very, very unlikely, but it's possible. Um, now, what happens in the more likely event that there are individual states where the outcome is contested. Um, the statute that determines, that governs uh, that situation is the Electoral Count Act of 1877, a statute that was enacted following the hotly contested centennial presidential election of 1876, the one between Rutherford Hayes and Samuel Tilden, in which Tilden won the popular vote. Hayes won the electoral vote by one vote, um, and, and Hayes was accepted as, as president. But that was a, a, an appalling outcome. 
uh, and Congress enacted this statute. It's never had to be used and it is almost impossible to read. I must say, over the last 48 hours, I've tried a number of times to make sense of it. Apparently though, uh, well, we know some, certain things, certain things are clear. The Electoral College will meet on December 14th. Each state's electors meet in the state capital and they cast their votes. But what happens if in some state it is unclear who won the electoral votes? Um, the states get to decide that. The states get to come up with procedures to deal with the unlikely but far from impossible situation in which for whatever reason, allegations of fraud or massive paper balloting with problems about counting and legitimacy, the states get to decide how they will count. And the constitution says, again, not only the states, but the state legislatures get to decide. And that's important because just last week, we had cases come before the Supreme Court in which parties were arguing about procedures put in place in certain states, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, in which the uh, State Electoral Commission has attempted to come up with ways of accommodating the needs of people concerned about COVID-19. And in a couple of those cases, the Supreme Court deferred to the decisions of the state agencies and allowed, for example, in Pennsylvania, allowed the state of Pennsylvania to count votes that are postmarked by election day, even if they don't arrive by election day, that's great. But there was a challenge to the state of Wisconsin, which wanted to do approximately the same thing. And the Supreme Court said no. And in its decision, for which it gave no reasons, as is typical in emergency motions, a number of the justices wrote their concurring opinions in which they did explain their individual reasons. And one of those um, uh, in the Wisconsin case was Justice uh, Brett Kavanaugh. And Justice Kavanaugh issued a concurring opinion in which he said that um, the teachings of the Supreme Court are that the state legislature gets to rule the state courts that have overridden state legislative directions in the individual states do not have power to do that. The legislature governs, and Justice Kavanaugh was suggesting, even if what the state legislature has done is contrary to the constitution, uh, much less the statutes of the particular state in question. A really remarkable concurring opinion in which he relied firmly on a concurring opinion, not the court's opinion, in the dreadful case of Bush v. Gore, the case in which in 2000, the Supreme Court said, we are not setting a precedent. We are dealing with a unique situation. Do not read this opinion very carefully. Um, and uh, nevertheless, um, Justice Kavanaugh at least, uh, seems to think that the legacy of Bush v. Gore is that the state legislatures may do whatever they do without any kind of judicial oversight. And if that isn't anti-democratic, I don't know what is. Imagine the idea that state legislatures would be empowered to institute rules for the, count, the casting of votes or the qualification of voters or the counting of votes without any concern that their own state courts might find those rules to be inconsistent with the state constitution. So we could have to face problems. There could be litigation, there almost certainly will be litigation. That litigation, if it's simply in states that are not going to affect the ultimate outcome, will be uh, stuff that only lawyers can love. But if it affects the outcome, there could be serious uncertainty across this land. And again, in 2000, we, we waited a whole month to find out who won the election. Um, I don't think that we have that much patience today. Okay, so let me move on quickly because I see that uh, this has taken a little more time than I hoped it would to, to make some suggestions as to how to watch the election returns on Tuesday night. 
And what I've done here is I, I'm going to indicate to you as the evening goes on what to look for. The first states to close, as I mentioned, are the states of Kentucky and Indiana, or at least most of Indiana. Some states span more than one time zone. Indiana is one of them, Florida, Texas. Um, in states that span more than one time zone, um, the polls may close at different times, the results may come out partially, but Kentucky and Indiana, at least at presidential level, are reliably read. So it is predictable that the first results that we get on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. or shortly thereafter will show Donald Trump with a substantial electoral college lead. Don't turn off your televisions quite yet. At seven o'clock, Georgia, South Carolina, Virginia, and Vermont close and most of Florida closes. That is the part of Florida that's in the Eastern time zone, all of the, all of the state of Florida except the Panhandle. Florida will be critical. So watch carefully what happens in Florida. Watch carefully what happens in Georgia. Georgia is a re predictably, reliably red Southern state. No Democrat has won in Georgia since Jimmy Carter, who had been governor of Georgia. If Joe Biden does well in Georgia, if the Democratic Senate candidates, remember there are two races there, if they do well, we can expect that that indicates a major shift in the direction of a Democratic victory. The same is true in Florida. Florida is predicted to be close. The polling is showing a couple of percentage points either way. If Florida declares early, if the lead of either Trump or Biden in Florida is big enough to allow the networks to declare Florida for either side early, that is a big indicator of what may happen next. At 7.30, North Carolina and Ohio close. North Carolina is a critical swing state this year. North Carolina voted for uh, Barack Obama in 2008, but shifted to Mitt Romney in 12, has not, uh, and was a Trump state, a reliable Trump state in 2016. This year, the Democrats think they have a good shot, not only at winning uh, North Carolina at the presidential level, but at ousting Tom Tillis, the sitting Republican Senator, uh, in the Senate race. So watch that one carefully. Ohio, critical swing state, lately redder than, than in the past. No Republican candidate has ever been elected to the presidency without carrying Ohio. And so if Ohio is close, if Biden wins Ohio, Trump really has no path to victory. If Trump wins Ohio and it's close, we might infer that other states that are similar in demographics to Ohio uh, may be blue, and that would make a big difference. Um, at eight o'clock, 22 jurisdictions will close their polls, including some swing states. Maine, which allocates electors, remember, not on a winner-take-all basis, but on a congressional district basis. Michigan, one of the three states forming the so-called blue wall that failed to protect Hillary Clinton in 2016. Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, those are critical. Michigan closes at eight o'clock. New Hampshire, one of the few states that Trump believes he can pick up from the Democrats. He lost New Hampshire in 2016. He thinks he has a shot at winning it today. It closes at eight o'clock. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania of all of the bellwether states, Pennsylvania is the bellwetherest of all. If, and Pennsylvania, again, one of the three states that, that Hillary Clinton failed to win in 2016, even though everyone thought it was in her pocket um, and was outcome determinative. So watch Pennsylvania carefully. However, as we know, Pennsylvania will have a lot of late arriving votes. It may not be possible to get an outcome Tuesday night in the state of uh, Pennsylvania. Alabama closes at eight o'clock. I don't think there's any doubt about the outcome of the presidential vote in Alabama, but the Senate vote might be close. Arkansas closes at 8.30. Red state, don't worry about it. Nine o'clock, 14 states close at nine o'clock. Uh, these are all Eastern times that I'm giving, um, including swing states. Arizona, a state the Democrats have some confidence in winning this year, although they lost it in 16. Colorado, which has a Senate race the Democrats need to win, as does Arizona. Minnesota, 
Minnesota is the singular best opportunity for a Republican pickup. Trump lost Minnesota very narrowly in 16. If there's any kind of a red shift this year, we can expect Minnesota to go red. Let's watch that carefully. New York closes at nine o'clock, no doubt about that. And finally, Wisconsin closes at nine o'clock. And Wisconsin will be watched like a hawk. Again, the key states to watch, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, the three states that Hillary Clinton was supposed to win and didn't win in 2016, plus North Carolina, Colorado, Arizona, Georgia, plus obviously Florida and Ohio, the perennial uh, swing states. Six states close at 10 o'clock, including Iowa, which is a potential swing, Montana, not in play at the presidential level, but very much in play at the Senate level. And in, finally at 11 o'clock, the West Coast closes, California, Washington, and Oregon. It was at 11.01 at, on uh, election night in 2012, uh, 2008. I was watching election returns with some SICE students. And at 11.01, the networks called California, Washington, and Oregon for Barack Obama and that gave him the electoral majority, which meant that by 11.15 that night, John McCain had conceded, Obama was on his way to Grant Park to give what I continue to think was the best political speech of his career to this day. Um, and um, the election was over before we all went to bed. I don't think that's going to happen this year. It might, we don't know. Uh, my crystal ball doesn't work any better than yours but I hope I've given you some ideas as to what to watch for. You know, I was brought up to think, and I, I, I always believed this, and, and maybe everybody of my generation did, that there is a, a, a Chinese expression that says, it's a, a curse, may we live in interesting, or may you live in interesting times. My Chinese students at SAIS all to a person tell me that's nonsense, there is no such Chinese expression, but we live in interesting times, for better, or for worse. And those of you who are not American, who are in this country, or will be watching this country carefully, you'll be living through some interesting times next Tuesday. And so um, that the open questions, just let me mention them quickly. Will both sides accept the outcome of this election, especially if we don't have a definitive outcome on Tuesday night? If the final outcome may be delayed a few days, will both sides accept? If Donald Trump loses, what happens? Does he pardon himself for uh, the various federal investigations in which he has been implicated? Um, will he attempt, if he loses, to lock in some of the decisions that have been made toward the end of his this term uh, so that they can't be undone by President Biden? Um, will he voluntarily leave the White House? And even putting that question aside, can we all envisage on January 20th at 11 o'clock in the morning, as tradition requires, the new president, the president-elect, and the sitting president joining in the limo in front of the White House, getting in that car, and driving up to Capitol Hill for the new president to be sworn in? Presidents have done that since since the beginning of the 20th century, certainly, and maybe longer ago. Sometimes they hated doing it. Dwight Eisenhower reportedly hated having to sit next to John F. Kennedy in 1961. Will Donald Trump do that? I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, um, and, and finally, the big question. The big question is, how do we heal after this? I have no particular views on that subject, but I think it's the big one that we should all be thinking about. When this is over, how do we come together? Do we come together? Or are we looking at a much more serious and perhaps more dramatic um, split in the American population? Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you about Tuesday night. I hope it's helpful. Arthur, thank you and over to you to field the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for a very, inter very interesting and very provocative presentation. At the end, you raised more questions than can possibly be answered in the little time remaining. 
But we do have some questions from the audience. So let me read you the first two. They're from the same participant and they're basically the same question. Uh, he asks, uh, Jack Klein asks, given all the trouble with the registration process and the balloting process, the election process, what changes can we expect in the next four years to both uh, processes? Well, again, um, those are both registration and voting itself are governed by state law. Um, I think the states that uh, are the most embarrassed by their chaotic handling of uh, election night are the ones most likely to adopt changes. And I would anticipate that even the states that have to be dragged kicking and screaming into uh, reform will all recognize that advanced voting, absentee voting, uh, remote voting are here. They can't be ignored. And, and procedures are going to have to be put in place that are fair. And that means fair to disabled people, fair to minorities, fair to people who live in cities, fair to people who may have transportation issues and who live out in rural areas. I think we can, we can imagine that in 50 state houses across this great land, uh, we're going to see major overhauls all of them, I think, motivated by a desire, at least by one of the political parties, to make it, to make the vote available to all. And unfortunately, that has not been the theme of this election. We will have four years to think better, think harder, think more fairly, think more in keeping with the American tradition and with the Constitution itself. I hope that happens. But isn't the problem that those changes must come at the state level, not absolutely. at the federal level? Yep, absolutely, that's the problem. Um, okay, second, second question, um, this is from Alex. He asked two questions and his first has been answered already. He asks, uh, split tickets, how likely are voters to vote for a Democratic president and Republican senator or vice versa? Very, 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 according to the polling. Um, in, in swing states, this could be critical. Um, so for example, um, there is, I mean, again, my prediction powers are notoriously terrible, but um, I, I would be willing to bet substantial funds on the idea that Donald, that Joe Biden has absolutely zero chance of carrying the state of Montana. And yet the Senate race is expected to be very, very close. Uh, I think that um, even if, um, as is predicted, uh, Biden carries Michigan, there is at least a chance that um, Gary Peters, the current sitting senator of the Democrat in Michigan, could lose. So uh, split voting is, is common in some states, not in all. I mean, it's not common in, in, in Alabama, in Mississippi, well, maybe even in Mississippi this year. Very powerful Democratic, Black Democratic candidate for the Senate. Uh, but uh, yeah, and obviously the votes are, you don't vote for a party in this country as you do in many European countries. You don't pull one lever. You've got to, if you're voting in person, you've got to do the, whatever it is, click on or, or check, put a check mark next to each individual candidate. I remember those days when we pulled the levers. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question from Christopher Olivares, who thanks you first for the wonderful series over the past few weeks. I agree, it's been very, very good. He says he's from Texas. There is a discussion which you referenced about Texas going for Biden. If that is the case on Tuesday night, does the conversation about swing states suddenly become less relevant? I think so. I, if Texas, you know, people have been predicting for ages that, that demographic shifts are going to turn Texas blue at some point in the 21st century. And the demographic shifts are, 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 have three parts in Texas. One, the, um, the increase in younger voters who skew in the democratic direction. Second is uh, the influx of Hispanic voters who skew sometimes very strongly in the direction of Democrats. And third is that the education level across the Texan population is, I mean, education level across the country is going up, but in Texas, it's going up very sharply. Um, and Nevertheless, so, they still elected Ted Cruz. Uh, yeah, they did, but that was a couple of years ago. We'll see whether they reelect John Cornyn. Cornyn, mm. who is number two in the Republican uh, hierarchy in the Senate, 
uh, is up for a seat that until very recently was not even considered in play by the Democrats. Now suddenly people are talking about the possibility of Cornyn losing. So it is conceivable. It would indicate if, if Biden wins Texas, then he's going to win Florida. And if he wins Texas, he's going to win other swing states, North Carolina. Um, and by the time that happens, I, I think we can be confident in the outcome. If Trump wins Texas, then he's simply done what he did in 2016 and what George um, W. Bush did in, in 2000 and 2004, what, what McCain did in, in 08 and what Romney did in 12, no surprise there. But if Texas shifts, that's earth changing. Um, and incidentally, if it doesn't change this year, I think by next time it will. I think this is what a lot of people are forgetting that we now have demographics at issue. Everything is in play and we're gonna see a lot of changes in the next few years. Indeed. Okay, we have a question from Steve Bemis. Do you have an opinion concerning the authority of the Supreme Court, a la Kavanaugh, to interpret the correctness of a state Supreme Court's interpreting its own voting laws? Very yeah, timely question. I, that's a fascinating question and a fascinating issue. I, I don't want to get too into the legal weeds here, but um, again, the Constitution says that state legislatures govern with respect to the rules of each state. And what happened, for example, in Bush v. Gore was the state legislature's set of rules was reviewed by the Florida Supreme Court. And the Florida Supreme Court said, if we're going to do this right, we've got to initiate a recount because under our state rules, we are uh, in, at risk um, of, of violating them. Um, the, the Florida Supreme Court, uh, that decision was reviewed by the Supreme Court of the United States. And by five to four, uh, the Supreme Court said, um, no, you're, you're reading it wrong. It's not the Florida Supreme Court that governs. It's the Florida legislature that governs and the legislature has spoken. That is what Chief Justice Rehnquist said in his concurrence in um, Bush v. Gore, not the opinion of the court. And Justice Kavanaugh, I think frighteningly, cited that the other day as if it were the decision of the court, which it was not, and that's just a matter of fact, and then cited it as authoritative, even though the Supreme Court itself said that we shouldn't do that. Between Bush v. Gore in 2000 and last week, the Supreme Court has mentioned Bush v. Gore once. And that was in a concurring, a dissenting opinion by Justice Thomas, in which he cited Bush v. Gore in a footnote. And all of a sudden, Kavanaugh is relying on that as precedent. And so not only is it, is it very poor, it seems to me, legal reasoning, but it, and, and relying on something that can't be relied on, but substantively it's seriously wrong because again, what the Supreme Courts of the states say in interpreting their state constitutions shouldn't raise any issue of federal concern at all, unless they're denying due process or equal protection. That's, that's not what's at stake here. So if the state Supreme Court, the Commonwealth Supreme Court in Pennsylvania opines that what the um, legislature has done is denying citizens the right to vote. We interpret the Pennsylvania Constitution to be that way. The Supreme Court of the United States should have no role to play at all. And that is what in, the, in his, I think, remarkable dissent in Bush v. Gore, that's why Justice Stevens wrote this. He said, Time will one day heal the wound. This is dissenting from Bush v. Gore. Time will one day heal the wound uh, that is inflicted by today's decision. One thing, however, is certain. Although we may never know with complete certainty the identity of the winner of this year's presidential election, the identity of the loser is perfectly clear. It is the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law, I therefore respectfully dissent. Words you of mean they don't just call balls and strikes? They don't just call balls and strikes. And in the- Okay, we have a question from uh, Joshua Cartwright. How likely are states that have governors and legislatures from opposing parties uh, to send competing delegations of electors? 
Well, it's certainly possible that that will happen. That is one of the one of the nightmare scenarios that a state like Pennsylvania, for example, which has a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature, the legislature could decide that um, it's going to order the say uh, counting of uh, mail-in ballots be stopped. Uh, the Democratic governor will oppose that. Um, the Republicans could theoretically conclude that the Republican slate of electors has been chosen based on a partial count, while the Democratic governor could say, you've got to count them all, and both could go to the um, Electoral College. Now, the Electoral College, as I say, meets, or the various states meet on December 14th. The results are delivered to Washington shortly thereafter, and they are opened in a joint session of Congress on January 6th. That means that the joint session of Congress, which will ultimately determine which votes to count, will be the new Congress, not today's Congress. And so if there is some concern about, if there's some concern from Democrats about the possibility of Republican governors or Republican legislatures attempting to steal the election by, by submitting uh, Republican slates of electors that have not won the popular vote, presumably a Democratic Congress on January 6th will be able to squelch that. But it is a concern. So, it is a concern. It's, it's an interesting concern. Alex Wright asks a question. If a Democratic wave takes place, what do you see happening uh, with Congress and the Voting Rights Act? Does it get updated by the Supreme Court uh, so it can't be picked apart? Uh, what will happen? Well, well, of course, it can't be updated by the Supreme Court. It's not the Supreme Court's role. But it certainly could be updated by Congress. Um, this Supreme Court, uh, in a decision coming from the state of Alabama, essentially gutted uh, the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was one of the guardrails uh, preventing states from denying, particularly minority citizens, uh, the right to vote, although it was not only the southern states that got in trouble under the Voting Rights Act, it included some northern states with large urban populations as well. But under that act, um, the Department of Justice uh, signaled that certain areas, certain states, needed to submit new voting rules for pre-clearance by the Justice Department. And Congress repeatedly uh, re-endorsed that structure in order to protect minority voting rights. And the Supreme Court, um, in a five to four vote, um, held that that was unconstitutional and, and no longer required, even though Congress had just recently re-upped it. Interesting that the conservative members of the court who profess great loyalty to the idea of legislative control. We're just the umpires, we don't make policy. They were the ones who were prepared to undo what Congress had done. They were prepared, if this isn't a classic case, I don't know what is, they were prepared to commit the mortal conservative sin of legislating from the bench. Okay, we have a question from Lloyd Scott. He thanks you first for the very detailed analysis. And he says that because of the, the count going on at very historic levels, early voting, it's all very interesting. Everybody's assuming that Democrats are voting for Biden, Republicans for Trump. But what are the independents going to do? Oh, what a good question. Um, yeah, what are the independents going to do? Um, again, the polling is showing uh, that independents are leaning blue. Um, across the country. But, um, you know, independents aren't all the same. Um, not that Democrats are all the same or Republicans are all the same, but there's likely to be a lot more variation among that cohort, that part of the population, not for lots of reasons. Uh, people are independent for lots of reasons. They could really be in the middle. They can't decide. Uh, they want to wait to see individual candidates and their platforms. That's one type of independent. There are also people who are too far left or too far right to identify themselves as members of parties. And there are also a huge number of people who are apathetic. Lloyd's question looks particularly at the swing states. He's interested in Florida, Carolina, Ohio, uh, among others. Yes, in, in particular, of course. And in those states, uh, well, let me take Florida, for example. There's an enormous elderly population. Elderly people have 
historically traditionally leaned red, not all of them by any means, not by a vast uh, majority, but, but they've leaned red, they've been more than 50% red. That appears to have evaporated. So what about independence among the elderly population? What are they motivated by? What do they care about? Do they care about Trump's personality or do they care about taxes? Do they care about, about immigration? Do they care about the threat of a Biden victory leading to socialism and anarchy and chaos? Who knows? And they are presumably not all necessarily motivated by the same thing. I dare say in the same household, you'll find people who are not motivated by the same thing. Okay, Nina Gardner has asked a good question. First, uh, she says it's a fabulous presentation, but like, like, like me, Nina's biased. So, <laughs> she says, is there any way there could be federal legislation mandating states to provide X number of voting machines per population to avoid voter suppression? Or is this state regulated? Well, it's state regulated, but, but you know, lots of things are state regulated. Uh, and the federal government has, has figured out a way to uh, insert itself. Uh, you know, speed limits on highways. Um, you know, the states were free to set speed limits any way they wanted until the oil crisis in the 1970s when it became apparent to Congress that a lot of fuel was being wasted in places like Montana where there were no speed limits. And so the feds came up with a scheme that said, all right, well, you can set your speed limit any way you want, Montana, but if you set your speed limit higher than the number that we have prescribed, we're going to withhold uh, road repair funds from you. So are you suggesting um, we take away hunting licenses? It could be, <laughs> <laughs> could be that. Um, there could be lots of, of, and I'm sure cleverer minds than mine, I'm focusing on this already, lots of uh, levers that can be pulled in order to provide financial compensation, or in, not compensation, but incentives um, either positive ones, like if you provide enough voting booth, voting uh, machines, um, then you'll get some extra benefit, or negative incentives. If you fail to do that, then you will fail to qualify for some aid system. Of course, you know, the downside to that is that if a state deliberately then provokes the federal response, who gets hurt by that? Poor people, minorities. They are the ones who get hurt. And so uh, it's not always so forgive me, black and white. Yeah, but it's an area we need to work on. Mm -hmm. Roshu Wong asks, do you think current stock market, the current stock market indicates the potential election results? No, I don't. Um, and, and uh, you know, certainly there will be one way or the other, there will be huge movement uh, next Wednesday uh, in the market, no matter what happens. Um, but remember, the day after Brexit, when everybody in the United States was shocked and the market tanked a thousand points, within a couple of days it was back again. So I, I, don't, I don't think that short-term fluctuations in the stock market are good reliable indicators of anything. There will be turmoil on the market Wednesday, um, maybe such dramatic turmoil that, that you know, trigger points are, are reached and the market even has to shut down for a short time. But um, now, in the longer term, it, if, if depending on individual industrial sectors, they may have some serious concerns about a potential Biden administration or a potential second Trump administration, which cause stock trends. But that's not next week. That's going to be seen over a longer term. In any case, given your COVID rate, I would say that pharmaceutical stocks are still a safe play. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> We have a couple Especially more questions. Whoever has got the short, the, uh, the short track to the vaccine. Sorry. We have a couple more questions. Do we have time for them? Yes, Professor. We can, we can take another 10 minutes or so okay. right now. So Lloyd Scott asks, where do you see the country headed if Biden wins or, God forbid, we have a second Trump term? <laughs> this is a biased question, isn't it? Oh. What is the potential global aftershocks or impact? Um, that question has so many levels and layers um, that it's really impossible to do it justice. Um, obviously there have been, just in terms of foreign policy, there have been so many um, different kinds of fallout from the last four years. 
uh, and here I, I abandon any pretense to, to objectivity, <laughs> frankly. Um, I, I think that if we have, if Joe Biden is elected, I would see the United States uh, rejoining the Paris Climate um, Convention. I would see uh, the United States rejoining the World Health Organization. Um, almost immediately, I would see, a, I would imagine, a, an effort to reinitiate um, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, concerning the Iran nuclear program. So I think the United States will, uh, in, under a Biden administration, will rush very quickly to, um, to do those, to undo the things that can most easily be undone. But those are all, those all have to do with simple things like getting out of an organization or pulling out of a treaty. That can be undone by the president's stroke of a pen. But what about the other consequences of these four years? What about the damage that has been done to American prestige? What about the idea that in much of the world we're a laughingstock? That's gonna take some time. I don't see the rest of the world saying, oh, thank goodness you've come to your senses. It's all okay now. Uh, we love you again. Um, I think the question, what are you guys doing is not substantially different from what have you guys been doing? Um, that won't be fixed overnight. That may take a while and you know, it may, it may never happen. Already you know, my, my international human rights law clinic is studying the law of privacy um, this year. And we're looking into it in great depth and we're seeing one of the, one of the many consequential changes in, in, in the world uh, that is triggered by concerns about privacy is the idea that the European Union, through its general, direct, general regulation on data protection, the GDPR, has taken the lead on privacy protection and everyone around the world is measuring themselves up to a European standard. Once upon a time, the United States set standards like that not in privacy, but in many other areas. Are you, or is our country meeting the American expectation? And that's gone away. And I don't think that's coming back. Sitting in Geneva, I can tell you the mood is, the impression of the United States has really gone down in these sure. last four years, sure. particularly vis-a-vis -vis the international organizations here. Joshua asks another very interesting question, two parts. First, is there enough evidence to indicate a campaign of voter suppression by the Republican party? That one's easy to answer. Yes. The second good. part's a little bit harder. What legal remedies are available to combat that? Well, the answer to the first question is yes. I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any, that's not even a partisan answer. I mean, the Republicans themselves have, have, have repeatedly in state houses around the country said that, you know, that, that the goal is to make it harder um, to vote. And, and, you know, they claim that they're driven by concerns about voter fraud and forged ballots and, and uh, uh, you know, multiple voting and, and things like that. But of course, there's, there's never been any evidence uh, of, of uh, a person voting more than once uh, on any kind of substantial level. And when I say substantial, I'm talking about, you know, 100 votes in the country in any given year. And I don't think we even have reached that number. So um, um, I think, and, and Donald Trump has said, if, if we're going to open uh, the country to uh, paper ballots, to advanced voting, to absentee voting, no Republican will ever get elected again. It's perfectly clear um, that there is a, a campaign to limit the voting again, especially in certain populations. Um, what can be done about that? Well. On, on a state level, obviously a lot can be done. Game changers, right? In states around the country where you, where you have rules like the ones adopted in Texas concerning one drop off place per county, that's an absurdity. Even if it's legal, it's nuts. The Democrats apparently have a good shot, I'm told, at winning, even if they, Texas remains red at the presidential level and John Cornyn is reelected, Democrats have a reasonable shot at winning the state legislature, the state house in, in Texas, which even though there's a Republican governor and there might still be a Republican Senate, state Senate, um, it does open the possibility that state laws in Texas could change. That is where 
people ought to be focusing their attention, not hoping for some genius solution on a national level, you know, involving the withholding of federal funds or something. Focus on the states in which this problem is especially acute. That's where it needs to be solved. Nina Gardner, Professor Gardner asks another good question. She says that she's read that executive orders enacted in the last 60 days can be easily undone by a new administration. Is that true? Uh, what is the reasoning behind this? Well, any executive order can be undone. Um, I mean, they're executive orders. The president is the executive. He or she gets to order. <laughs> That's what an executive order is. Um, so any policy put in place through executive order could in principle be undone. Now I say in principle because sometimes the um, executive order has been relied on uh, in various ways around the country by individual citizens, by companies, by states, by localities, um, and um, uh, there might be some equitable uh, issues about unfairness to those who have taken the executive order at face value and have acted accordingly. But in principle, that's true. Now, as we know, as I think all of this audience knows, um, in the United States, because of the very uh, strict rules for becoming a party to a treaty, the president frequently uses his executive authority to become parts, for the United States to become parts of international agreements um, either to become parts or to withdraw. JCPOA is an example. It was never submitted to the Senate for advice and consent. Um, and so to take that example, uh, Trump's executive order pulling the United States from the JCPOA could be revoked in a heartbeat. Now, the other parties to that joint agreement, the other five, I guess it is, parties would need to approve would need to agree to have the United States come, up, come back in. But the US impediment to rejoining that institution would be removed. We have a, another question, a voting rights question. What happens if you've asked for your absentee ballot, let's say you're in Europe and you're no longer there and it never arrived and you're back in the States, can you go to the polls and vote without the ballot? What would happen? Or does it depend oh, state by state? Yeah, I believe you, well, it depends on, on the states, of course, yes. It's, that's the simple answer to any granular question about, you know, what do I do if? That The answer will always be, it depends on what, what state you live in. But if you have not cast your absentee ballot, then you, it should be open to you to cast at least a provisional ballot. A provisional ballot is a vote, in most states anyway, is a vote cast like a pro, under protest, if you like, where you get to vote and the question of whether your vote will count will depend upon the outcome of some determination. Now, in many states, provisional ballots are kept, they're counted, and only if the count of the provisional ballots is potentially outcome determinative, either at the presidential level or at the state level, or perhaps at even a local level, only then are they counted. Otherwise, they're just thrown out. But at least that means that if your vote matters in retrospect, then it will be counted. So I would strongly advise a person in that situation, go to the polls on election day, explain to the poll watchers what happened, and insist on being given a provisional ballot. We've made it so easy in Switzerland. For every election, for every referendum, you get a letter in the mail with the ballot, and your choice is to go to the, to the polls and deposit it in a box or to mail it back in. And now we're experimenting with voting by uh, internet. Yeah. And it's, it, it's good. And having sure. all of that, it's surprising. The voter turnout is often less than 50%, even oh. though it's so easy to vote. You no, know, it's easy. We well, you know yeah. an, interesting, an interesting little factoid is that there are a couple of states in the United States that have made it very, very easy to vote remotely and have done it for years. And one of those states is Utah, a blood red Republican state. And there's never been any question of fraud in Utah. It's, well, that goes back to our voter suppression question. Indeed. Okay, Jack Klein asks, it's nice to imagine a world where the US can rapidly regain some of its footing in the international order. However, do you think the massive amount of conservative federal judges appointed in the past four years will be a roadblock uh, to this prospective goal under uh, if Biden uh, wins the election? Well, no. 
I guess I don't think that because the the um, the number of areas in which the new conservative judges will actually be able to overturn uh, congressional enactments or state enactments will be, I think, relatively small, at least in the short run. So I'm not sure that, for example, a Supreme Court vote to overturn Roe v. Wade or more to the point to overturn Planned Parenthood v. Casey uh, would have um, a very big international impact. After all, there are other states uh, in, the, in the world community in good, or, in good standing um, that have different attitudes toward questions like abortion or questions like gay rights or questions that are so incredibly divisive in this country. And look, we've had the Supreme Court um, in the 2000s um, decided, in my view, made up out of whole cloth, but never mind, decided that the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution means that individuals have a right to own firearms, um, and then made it worse by saying that not only did the federal government not restrict it, but the state governments may not restrict it. Rather a barbarian position compared to the rest of the world, and I don't know how much it cost, that cost us in prestige. Um, death penalty, um, we are one of two members of the OECD that have the death penalty. Um, other states may well be appalled by that. I'm appalled by that, but never mind that. Um, yeah, and, so do uh, the, does, does the definition of cruel and unusual punishment change over time? Or do we look at what, what it was in 1779? Well, it, it has changed over time. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about that. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, the question, you know, one of the many questions that uh, Justice Barrett was not asked and should have been asked during her confirmation hearings was not, what do you think about abortion? But by what standards should we decide today whether punishment is cruel and unusual? The Eighth Amendment says no cruel and unusual punishment. Got that. If the founders had meant to say, uh, you know, no hanging, they would have said so. They didn't say so. And yet many years later, the Supreme Court of the United States said, no, hanging is by today's standards, cruel and unusual. We're not going to tolerate it. So th that is the classic illustration of language used in the Constitution that cannot be definitively interpreted by originalism. It makes no sense unless we're going to restore stocks and whipping and... The other, of course, is Brown v. Uh, Board of Education. Brown v. Board, of course, where the, you know, the Supreme Court in 1896 said uh, separate but equal in state-sponsored facilities, not a problem. In 1954, they said, at least in educational institutions, big problem. Why? Because equal protection, which had been in the Constitution from the beginning, was interpreted differently. Professor Gardner asks uh, whether provisional ballots are counted and how does that work? Well, as I said, in most states, as I understand it, they're counted only if they are needed. That is, if they are potentially outcome determinative. Otherwise, they're they're tossed. Um, the, but the pre specific procedures, again, are, are subject to individual states. Now, Professor Gardner says she's going to be a poll watcher on November 4th, so she'll tomorrow. be able to report back. Okay, uh, well, make her promise that she won't bring a firearm to the polling place. <laughs> yeah. That's in some states, people are worried about that. Now, there, there have been discussions in the paper today, and there's a very good uh, opinion piece by Free Zakari in the Post this morning as well. Um, okay, uh, Akansha, do we have a little bit more time, or how are we doing? We, uh, we can take a couple more minutes, Professor. Okay. Uh, we we have a, a question from Lois Gothen. Do you believe that the Democrats uh, believe that they have a good shot in Texas, Georgia, Arizona, and North Carolina? Or is this games, gamesmanship to keep Trump on the defense? No, I think they do have a good shot. I think it's a little bit late to be playing that kind of game. Um, I think that the Democrats uh, have not only a good shot, but a very good shot in of the states you mentioned, Arizona, Arizona and Colorado. Um, Texas, yeah, Texas is going to be a heavy lift for the Democrats. Um, no harm done, really, nationally, if, if that doesn't come to pass this time. Um, again, it's been a red state for a very long time. Uh, it will someday shift. Maybe it'll be this year. Maybe it'll be in four years. Um, but I think that uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of posturing throughout this campaign. I keep getting social media messages uh, you know, from candidates who say, 
uh, you know, I need a donation tomorrow or I'm losing, look at the poll results, I'm behind five points, when the Washington Post is reporting that that same candidate is ahead by 10 points. So yeah, there's a lot of posturing, but I, I think- The president's polls are also hard to read. We don't know where he gets his data from exactly. either. Exactly. But it's, in any, uh, it's the end of the day, there's only one poll that matters, right? And Gallup isn't taking it. What about North Carolina? I mean, yeah, you know, um, as I said earlier, Obama carried North Carolina in 2008. Um, with all of the hoopla of the 2012 campaign, you know, with Romney on the other side, um, the outcome in 2012 was almost identical to the outcome in 2008. Only two states shifted, and North Carolina was one of them, Indiana was the other. Um, North Carolina is a swing state. Uh, the city of Charlotte, you know, has become a very large city very quickly um, with a very uh, highly educated uh, workforce. Um, it is also a very diverse state with, with black voters representing a substantial portion of the voting population. Um, I think that, that uh, and, and the polls are showing that the Democratic candidate for the Senate seat, Cal Cunningham, despite his um, philandering. Personal, personal philandering. Um, uh, well, I mean, if philandering were a qualification for office, you know, or a disqualification <laughs> for office, we know who would be the first to go. But, um, but Cunningham, even in a in a state that has a large uh, cohort of religious voters, um, uh, Cunningham appears to be ahead. And the Democrats need that Senate seat. Without without North Carolina, uh, without the North Carolina Senate seat, Democrats are in trouble. So I think that uh, I think. North Carolina is, is winnable. Um, I think the polls are showing that, and I think, I think that will happen. I mean, the blue wave is definitely heading south. It is. And I think that's a very important point. The, demograph the demographics are to make it uh, even more apparent. Yes, I mean, you know, Arthur, you and I are old enough, although probably nobody else on this call is. Um, maybe, no, Nina Gardner is old enough. <laughs> no. Um, to remember when the South was solidly one party, it was solidly democratic, mm -hmm. and those were the racist, segregated, yeah, for all the wrong reasons. Horrible, yeah. horrible people. Um, and that was in the 1950s, not all that long ago. Justin has no questions, but he wants to send a round of applause. <laughs> and I, too, want to send a round of applause. This has been very, very good. You've been able to answer every question that was asked, even the difficult questions, in a very, very clear and frank way. And the amount of information you've given to the participants has been extraordinary. And judging by the number of participants that have hung on until the bitter end, this is very, very good as well. Stephen, I want to thank you very, very much for an excellent uh, morning in Washington and afternoon and evening in Geneva. And I turn it over to Akansha. Thank you so much, Professor Appleton and Professor Schneebaum. I actually have one question for the both of you. Um, recent surveys have shown that about 40% of Americans have either changed or left their jobs because of pol political beliefs and opinions. How do you think that's actually gonna play out in the coming year or in the next week? Because it is something that is, it, will, it impacts a lot of us, especially as international students. We, even though we have political beliefs, we can't exactly voice them as Americans would. Even that itself has a big impact. How does that look like for getting jobs or how companies are run. And just would love your opinion on that. This is the Chick-fil-A question, right? <laughs> and the Michael's Crafts or whatever. Go ahead, Professor Nebo. Domino, Domino's Pizza. Yeah, I, I think that, um, that uh, on a global level, cosmic, you know, 35,000 foot level, the answer to that question is uh, subsumed under the question that I asked at the very end of my prepared remarks, which was, can we heal after this? Um, and, and that's an open question because passions are running as high as they are. And it's not, I mean, the United States is no stranger to, to sharp ideological divisions within the population. We had it over race, we still have it over race. Um, we've had it over uh, internationalism, you know, the, the very isolationist part of the United States compared with uh, those more outward looking. We've, and we've weathered that storm. We've weathered, I think we've weathered the storm of gay rights. It was an enormously divisive issue. And I think we're past it. We haven't got past it on abortion. We haven't got past it on guns. 
Um, we haven't cut past it on the death penalty, although that's perhaps not as big an issue as the others. But I think that if, if we can, after this election, just calm down a little, um, just slow down and think about what unites us. And I know that these are such cliches, but it's true. If we are going to continue to be the United States of America, we've got to do something about that. And it's going to have to be something that is our individual responsibility. Every, every presentation I've participated in over the last couple of weeks has ended on that note. It has said, no matter what happens on Tuesday or thereafter, there is a lot of work to be done stitching this fabric back together. It has been torn. It has been torn badly. There's no point now at pointing fingers of blame. It has happened. Donald Trump didn't start it. We can talk about the factors that led to him, but we have to fix it. Biden's message on trying to healing the divide, I think, is a fairly effective message in this regard. And you know the people who are saying that, um, that, that, that it's important that that message get out even if the election turns out the other way, he's right, they're right. To, to go back to a conscious question, I think one problem with this debate is that if the Supreme Court continues to pursue uh, religious liberty questions over questions like uh, birth control and insurance, it can get very, very complicated. Yeah, it, it could, and, and I mean, that's a, a it's certainly a subject for another day, but I think that the, the debate over religious exceptions to statutory requirements with respect particularly to sexual minorities, um, you know, I, again, I don't mean to keep playing this card, but I, I, I think I've heard this song before. I can remember, and Arthur, I dare say, you can remember the days when people, when, when people said out loud, if God wanted the races to be integrated, he wouldn't have created them. There, I have a religious objection to swimming in the same swimming pool in Atlanta with a black person. I remember hearing those things. This was not just a personal preference. It was, it was divine law. And we got past that. And I think that the Supreme Court's um, recent, uh, some recent dissents or recent concurrences have shown that somehow or other, the religious convictions with respect to sexual minorities deserve more uh, respect, more tolerance, more, um, more deference than religious objections when we were young uh, were entitled to with respect to race. And I'm afraid I just don't understand that. I well, Gors Gorsuch's well, well, opinion was a surprise, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Right. Right. Akansha. Thank you so much, Professor. Absolutely. That was really interesting. Um, and I know this was a successful event because we've gone 30 minutes over time. So thank you everyone for all these amazing questions. Professor Gardner, I have read all the messages. Thank you so much for that. Um, and again, it was a wonderful event. We had this event specifically set up for today so that we could prepare, everyone could kind of get into the mode and get prepared for the elections. We will have another event next week, which is basically to detox from the elections and maybe <laughs> how to move forward. And depending on how everybody chooses to ease their pain, maybe deal with that a little bit, but we're gonna have that next week. Um, we, so the good uh, news is you think we're gonna have a decision by next Friday? I'm hopeful, Professor. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Someone has to be. Someone has to be. Uh, but again, I would like to thank everyone and especially my board. They have worked really hard for this past couple of weeks. We've had informal sessions, formal sessions, all of that. So a big shout out to my entire board. I know they all work really hard with midterms this week. We've all been through um, Zoom fatigue and with <laughs> elections coming up, I hope everyone is prepared and enjoys the weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Akansha. Thank, Thank you again, Professor, Professor Schneebaum, for a very, very good evening here in Geneva. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.